Um, good evening, you all know we've been in our faith and our spirit-led living um, series and focused on those different things. So today we're going to kind of continue um, and our topic today is how you maintain faith um, and spirit-led living when basically all hell breaks loose, when things get difficult. And we're going to look at the life of Nelson Mandela. And just as um, we're going into the um, the to the spirit led living and, and talking about spirit led living, it was just really amazing because when we are connected and we're tapped in, um, the Lord will just put things on your spirit. So after I had prepared prepared last week, um, the Lord kind of told me to use Mandela to take us through this next walk because he was somebody who has gone through so much turmoil and yet he just kept um, a certain spirit about him, a certain faith about him um, and was able to do um, almost miraculous things in the midst of going through trials that would have um, taken probably some of us out or totally, um, yeah, broken our spirits, some of our spirits. So um, it was just ironic because I didn't even know it was Nelson Mandela Day. So that's one of the things, the beautiful things about the Holy Spirit, how things just align. So our Wisdom Wednesday, when we were studying, set to study on Nelson Mandela, actually falls on um, Nelson Mandela Day. So today is Nelson uh, Mandela Day. So we're going to um, pay some homage to him, um, learn um, just basically from his lifestyle. He has some amazing quotes. So we're going to get into a lot of those things too. Um, we'll be back at Joe's um, this Sunday. So we were at the beach last week. So thanks to all who joined us. It was really a blessing. Um, and congratulations to the newly baptized. Um, so yeah, let's get right into it. And let's just um, open up with some prayer. So God, we give you honor, glory, and praise. God, we thank you for being a God who walks with us through the storm. Thank you for being a God who is able to keep us in the midst of the storm. Thank you for being a God that is a way maker, God, and shows us our way out of the storm, God. So right now, God, as we delve into the world and, and delve into the life of Nelson Mandela, God, I pray that you would just give everybody watching, everybody present here, God, just insight into their own lives, God, and how they need to move forward in order to press through, God, to keep the faith throughout the storm, God. We know that the storms are going to come throughout life, but God, when they come, we want to be able to be faithful, God. We don't want to be knocked off of our paths, God. So just be with us, God, as we go through this study to show us how to maintain our faith and maintain spirit-led living and spiritual living, God, in the midst of the storm, God. Touch and bless everyone who is joining us and all who will watch at a later point. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So before I, I thought about telling Nelson Mandela's story, but I was like, it'll be much more interesting to kind of watch a clip. So this clip, which we're going to um, play, is Nelson Mandela's life. So in order to kind of get a true feel for all that he's gone through, you kind of need to know um, his story. So this is a 13-minute video, which is way more exciting than listening to me um, read just on his life and um, some of his trials and tribulations that he went through. Again, um, today is Nelson Mandela Day. We're gonna go back to history a little bit and just examine his life um, as it pertains to the struggles and how he was able to keep his faith. Nelson Holihlahla Mandela began his life herding sheep and cattle in the rolling hills of South Africa's Eastern Cape. In his autobiography, part of which was written secretly while in prison, Mandela wrote, I was not born with a hunger to be free. I was born free. Free in every way that I could know. Free to run in the fields near my mother's hut. Free to swim in the clear stream that ran through my village. Free to roast mealies under the stars and ride the broad backs of slow-moving bulls. It was only when I began to learn that my boyhood freedom was an illusion, when I discovered as a young man that my freedom had already been taken from me, that I began to hunger for it. Nelson Mandela's given name, Holy Shata, literally means tagging at the branches of a tree. But at school, he was given the name of another famous leader. When I went to school, the lady teacher, Miss Mdingane, asked, what is your name? I told him my African name, Rakhulislas. He says, no, I don't want that one. You must have a Christian name. So I say, no, I don't have one. 
Schiff says, you are from today, you are going to be Nelson. So henceforth, he would be known to the world as Nelson Mandela. As the son of a chief, Nelson Mandela had access to the best education available to black people in South Africa at the time. Studying at Fort Hare University, where he first became involved in student protest, his refusal to accept injustice, unfairness, and inequality would last a lifetime. South Africa, 1941. In his early 20s, Nelson Mandela moved to Johannesburg, where he first encountered the racial discrimination that would later become entrenched in law by the apartheid government. Working on the mines, and later as a clerk in a law firm, Mandela pursued his law studies and joined the African National Congress, the oldest black political organization in South Africa. It was when I came into the African National Congress that I realized that uh, causes are only a part of uh, the African people. That the task of the ANC was to unite the African people and out of them build a nation. In 1948, the nationalist government was voted into power by the white electorate in South Africa and the battle lines were clearly drawn. Comrade Oliver said, well, I like this because we now know we have an enemy in power and I think that we're going to have a better opportunity of mobilizing our people. Our policy is one which is called by an Afrikaans word apartheid. And I'm afraid that has been misunderstood so often. It could just as easily and perhaps much better be described as a policy of good neighborliness. In 1955, the ANC and other organizations called upon people of all races to gather in Town to approve the Freedom Charter, a blueprint for a free, democratic, and multiracial South Africa, in which all races would be treated equally. Nelson Mandela, one of the chief organizers of the gathering, was banned by the government from attending and was forced to watch proceedings from the sidelines. In 1956, the organizers of the Freedom Charter and other leaders in the Congress movement were charged with high treason. The trial was specifically designed to occupy the opposition and keep them out of politics. It dragged on for four and a half years, and it would be another 40 years before the Freedom Charter finally bore fruit. South Africa, 1960, Sharpville, a black township in the industrial area south of Johannesburg, a peaceful crowd gathered to protest against the past laws was shot at by police. 69 people died. The nationalist government imposed martial law. All opposition was banned and thousands were jailed. When it became clear that all means of peaceful negotiation had been exhausted, Mandela went underground to lead the armed struggle. We have made it very clear in our policy that uh, South Africa is a country, a country of many races. There is room for all the various races in this country. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. Key government installations were targeted for sabotage. Mandela became known as the Black Pimpernel. In 1962, Mandela was captured, charged with leaving the country illegally, and sentenced to imprisonment for five years. Shortly afterwards, his ANC comrades were captured with evidence which incriminated Mandela. He returned to court for the Rivonia trial, where he and eight others faced a possible death penalty. The very speech which was made by Nelson 
consolidated the spirit of the people outside because it was a defiant spirit. I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the idea of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunity. It is an idea which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it is an idea for which I am prepared to die. When Nelson Mandela and several of his colleagues were sentenced to life imprisonment in 1964, the political convicts were sent to Robben Island, the bleak island prison of the Western Cape Coast. Nelson Mandela was 45 years old when he became prisoner number 466 of 1964. He would be in his early 70s before he would again be a free man. Forced to perform futile hard labor in a lime quarry, the prisoners refused to be broken. Far from being diminished, Mandela's moral leadership and stature continued to grow while he was in prison. His young wife, Winnie, continued to be an inspiration to the struggle. That day is not far when we shall lead you to freedom. Amanda! 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 Away to power to the people. But the struggle against apartheid would continue for another quarter century. While Nelson Mandela and his co-accused served life sentences on Robben Island, other leaders of all races and in all spheres campaigned for change. Many faced imprisonment or exile. And around the world, ordinary people showed their horror of apartheid and their support for the struggle. The purpose, friends, of this boycott is for the people of Britain to register on the widest possible scale their passionate protest against an evil and repulsive doctrine which says that a man's legal status, a man's political rights, a man's economic opportunities, a man's social position shall depend solely upon the color of his skin. But in 1976, Soweto school children marched in protest and townships around the country erupted in violence. It was the beginning of the end for apartheid, but the struggle dragged on for more than a decade as the African nationalist government clung to power. As the union and patience don't push us too far. In the late 1980s, amid a tide of world pressure, the South African government was forced to accept the inevitable and began dismantling apartheid. In 1990, at the age of 71, Mandela was released unconditionally. Negotiations for a new South Africa, Nelson Mandela cast his vote in the first free and democratic elections and became the country's first black president. Never, never, and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression, 
of one by another. For the duration of his presidential term, and throughout what should have been a well-earned retirement, he has worked tirelessly to entrench the ideals he has so long stood for, becoming universally revered as an icon of leadership and humanity. When I told one of my advisors a few months ago that I wanted to retire, he growled at me, quote, you are retired. <laughs> <laughs> if that is really the case, then I should say, I now announce that I'm retiring from retirement. <laughs> But in his retirement from retirement, Nelson Mandela has continued to give his support and generosity in countless ways, creating an enduring legacy through the Nelson Mandela Foundation, the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, the Mandela Rhodes Foundation, the Nelson Mandela Institute for Education and Rural Development, and the 4664 campaign. Through 4664, he continues to lend the full force of his extraordinary talent, intellect, and heart to a problem that faces not only his own country, but the world at large. Nelson Mandela, Madiba, we salute you. President of South Africa, which is just the irony of him being the first black president, president of an African um, nation is just um, really amazing and when we talk about the level of trials this was definitely um, a man who went through some serious trials hopefully you all can hear some of the different things that he went through but they tried to really break him um, he was that when he was in prison the first six years he was actually in solitary confinement so he was in solitary confinement for the six, first six years of his prison sentence and everybody knows when he was the love of his life and um, he couldn't see her, but every six months. So they did everything that they could to possibly to possibly break his spirits. And yet Nelson Mandela maintained this sense of courage. He maintained a faith that we today can kind of look to. So I want to read this quote. Um, and if we're able to kind of capture it, maybe we can capture it online because we're going to kind of break this quote down. And he says, I am fundamentally an optimistic whether it comes from nature or nurture, I cannot say. Part of being optimistic is keeping one's head pointed towards the sun, one's feet moving forward. There were many dark moments when my faith in humanity was sorely tested, but I would not and could not give myself up to despair. That way lays defeat in death. I'm going to read that one more time. I am fundamentally an optimistic. Whether that comes from nature or nurture, I cannot say. Part of being optimistic is keeping one's head pointed toward the sun, one's feet moving forward. There were many dark moments when my faith in humanity was sorely tested, but I would not and could not give myself up to despair. That way lays defeat and death. And I just love this quote. Um, I'm a fundamentally optimistic person too. And it's amazing though, because when we go through different trials and when we go through different tribulations, it can become really difficult to remain optimistic because all you see is the problems at hand. And I, I will never forget the time when I had to give my first um, sermon in divinity school. And it was the around the time that Trayvon Martin had been killed. And I was just in such a state of despair that I couldn't find the words to even preach. I was just like, what are we doing? And, and the Lord was like, you're acting like a person who has no hope. And as a believer, there is always hope that you have to look to. And our perspective as believers have to be different in our storms. That's what's different. And that's what's going to set us aside is 
our perspective as a believer and how we end up looking at things and, and how we allow the Holy Spirit to be our guide versus being blinded by our problems and being blinded by the situations and the different things that we're going through. So just looking at this again, keeping one's head pointed towards the sun. Our first scripture is Psalms chapter 121. Verses 1 through 2. Psalms. Oh, it's a paper right there. I'm sorry. It's a, a paper right there with a scripture, if that helps too. So our first scripture is Psalms chapter 121, verses 1 through 2. And it says, I lift up my eyes to the hills from where my help come. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And when I think about this, what Mandela is quoting and going hand in hand with it, saying, keeping one's head head pointed towards the sun. And then verse one of the scripture says, I lift up my eyes to the hills from where my help comes. And one of the things that is so important when we're going through is to keep our heads lifted up. You'll often be able to tell somebody um, when they're going through, your head will start to hang low, how you feel about yourself. And, and it's like one of those things where we almost have to physically shift in our bodies and allow ourselves to stand up but it's also an emotional and a spiritual shifting where I'm lifting up myself I'm looking up and I'm knowing that I am a person who has hope and I'm actually going to look to the Lord and understand that that's where my help is going to come from so our vantage point in the midst of the storm is so critical because it's that vantage point that's going to allow us to keep our eyes focused on the Lord versus our issues and the problems that we're actually going through. So Nelson Mandela, throughout his life, he had to continue to look up. And I imagine being in solitary confinement, there were no windows. But yet there had to be a spiritual thing of where he's, he's standing up. And as we're moving by the Spirit, there are times you are where we have to begin to stand. You know, we often like to lay out on the floor. And sometimes, you know, even when we're um, doing engaging in prayer ministry and, and healing and deliverance, we'll lay hands and people will lay out on the floor and the spirit has to work and do the movement. But there's also times where folks don't need to necessarily lay out on the floor. They actually need to be held up and to be made to stand because we have to be rerouted. So sometimes we have to get to that point where, God, I'm going to stand up. If all I do every day, let me, I don't know if I'm, I may get off the camera like this, but I don't feel like getting up in the morning, but I'm going to just stand up. I'm going to stand up and, and I'm going to look up and I'm going to say, God, I lift my eyes to the hills and this is where my help comes. And if we have to do that and we have to do that over and over again until we actually feel that thing, sometimes we have to do that. And there's something about standing up and to, to remember that we have power um, within us. I'm sitting back down now, but um, to remember that we have actually the power in, in, in moving in the physical and allowing our spirits to just be guided by whatever it is that we need to be regrounded and to be rerouted. So lifting your eyes to the hills from where my help comes and understanding that my help comes from the Lord. And this doesn't just stop there and say my help comes from the Lord, but my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And this is a reminder that God is the creator of all things. And God being the creator of all things means that God has the ability to be in your situation. God has your situation in God's hands. So we have to remember, God, you have even this situation that looks like a total mess. You still have this in your hands and I'm going to look to you and I'm going to see what it is that you're, what, that it is, what it is that you're saying to me. There was a post that I did um, earlier this week and it said it's a game changer when we begin to ask ourselves instead of saying, why is this happening to me? God, show me what this is supposed to teach me. Show me what this is supposed to teach me. So our vantage point in the midst of the storm, sometimes, y'all, we just have to literally lift our heads up. Um, I often think about the, the animals who are teaching their young um, to walk. And those particularly, I, we see this with deer when they're, they're sprawled out and they can't get up. And, you know, it's probably a lot easier for the, them to just carry them and put them in pouches and different things like that. But you'll find them nudging them to get up and to be able to stand because it comes to a point where in life we have to stop allowing the storms to knock us down and be like, God, I'm going to stand. I can stand. So... We get us some folks and get you some folks around who will be like the mama deer and the birds who will help you and nudge you, not necessarily carry you because we don't want to be dependent. We want to be able to stand on our own, but some folks who will nudge you when you're going through the trials and remind you to look up and remind you to keep the hope alive.
So many dark moments. Nelson Mandela didn't fake like these moments in his life weren't dark. He was in prison. He was in solitary confinement. He was in a place where he was literally born and yet they were given second class citizenship and told that they, they weren't worthy of, of citizenship. He, in his native land, this is what was going on. So he definitely went through some things. Um, first Peter Chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. So our vantage point, y'all, our vantage point matters. Looking at 1 Peter, chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. Um, this is something else that is critical for us to do um, when, when, when we go through. And it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. When we're suffering, we tend to be off guard. Our guards get let down. We stop being alert. We stop being of sober minds. And really, we kind of go into... Um, Sometimes we go into our own pity parties. Sometimes we go into our own states of um, depression. We go into different things, but we stop being alert and we stop living um, and focusing on the spirit and what God is necessarily doing in our lives. And we, we tend to get distracted. So as we're distracted, we can miss the big picture. So here, um, you know, the big picture even for Mandela was freedom. The big picture for Mandela was equality for all people. But if he had stopped right there, he would have only seen I'm in prison. Um, I'm being um, I'm attacked by the government, even trying to be peaceful. He would have had a vantage point that is like literally right here. And a lot of times when we aren't of sober mind and we don't stay clear, our vantage point is literally right here. So we miss what God is doing in the big picture because we're kind of stuck. So it's really important for us to keep those sober moments and to be alert when we're going through, even more so than when we're on our, our, our P's and our Q's and everything is going right. Because at, at those times, we are more in tune um, with the spirit, but a lot of times when we're going through, we tend to think God isn't um, around. We tend to kind of let our, again, let our guards down and kind of go into um, our pity parties and get into ourselves. But remember in the second part of the scripture, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring, roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So when we are at our weakest points, it's not like the enemy is like, oh, now they're good. I'm going to step back and leave them alone. This is when the enemy is like, let me see if I can throw something else at them. And let me throw something else at them at this point, because now it's easier to attack them. They're not on um, alert. Their spiritual eyes aren't open. They're already just focused on their problem. So let me see if I can throw another problem at them and put another burden on them. And when we aren't alert and we don't recognize those attacks, we're not even praying in the manner that we should be praying necessarily because we're focused again on um, one particular issue versus these attacks and the different things that are going on. So it is so um, important for us to pay attention and understand that when we don't, when we, we let our guards down, the enemy will throw different things at us that will tend to break our spirit. So I just want to pause right there because I'm talking kind of fast. There is um, a lot. Um, that is here, but just check in for, for those online. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Jean. Um, hi, I'm Diane. Welcome. Oh my gosh. Hey, Jamie. Um, but the attacks, you all, are, are really real. So resist him. It says standing firm in the faith. Standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. So one of the other tricks that when we're going through of the enemy is to make us believe that we're the only ones going through this. And if the enemy can make us think that we're the only ones going through this, then all of a sudden it gets us into this mode of why me, why me? And we begin to look again inwardly and we begin to place blame on ourselves. And again, our vantage point shifts where we're not able to see the big picture, but understand that this world, we are promised troubles, you all, we are promised struggles. And I encourage different folks to get in support groups for the issues that you may have. Um, they have Facebook support groups now and different support groups for almost everything from loss of children to different health conditions to grieving groups to, to people struggling, um, raising children who have different illnesses. So there are all types of support groups and we have to get around folks who are going through and actually moving through. So one of the things that the quote says um, 
is keeping one head, one's head pointed toward the sun, one's feet moving forward. So when we're going through, it's so important, you all, even if we can't run at the same pace that we were running before, but to continue to move forward, even if it's just that standing, I'm lifting up my head, but making sure that you are standing firm in faith. So again, in this scripture, we see that notion of standing because we have to stand. The enemy will try to knock us off our guards, try to make us think different things, but we have to stand firm in our faith and what we know and knowing that we're not going through these different things um, alone. And also when we remain alert and aware of the different things that are happening, um, our trials and our tribulations will tend to last um, a lot. They, they won't last as long as if we aren't on high alert. So when we aren't on high alert, all of a the sudden these things begin to pile up and we, because we haven't dealt with them or we're not really paying attention or in tune with the spirit of, to what they are, we are, we have a more difficult time being able to work through them. So again, one of the important things of working through your issues as they come so that you have um, capacity. So the second part of Mandela's quote, he says, there were many dark moments when my faith in humanity was sorely tested, but I would not and could not give myself up to despair. That way lies defeat and death. So making up our minds and sometimes even standing up, if you commit to yourself, I will not give myself up to despair. Sometimes in our spirits and our hearts, we actually give ourselves over to despair and we do um, give up. We give up and as believers, we can't give up and turn over to despair because what he says is so true, which is that way lies defeat and death. So I just want to check in and ask some of those folks, how do you ensure that you don't turn yourself over to despair? How do you make sure that you keep your faith in some of the dark moments? So anybody who's watching online will definitely love. Um, what about you all? Anything about despair? And, and how do you make sure that you continue to stand in your faith versus giving over, giving yourself over to the despair? Gratitude. I make myself like um, say what I'm grateful and thankful for out loud. And like, I remember that constantly, but it doesn't necessarily come naturally when you're in that state. Mm -hmm. So I have to like sit down and really think about everything I'm grateful for. Okay. That's good. So gratitude and, and the fact that it doesn't come naturally when it's in this, our state is why sometimes we can have, it's, it's good to have like wisdom Wednesdays because we need to be reminded, okay, I'm going through, this is the stuff that I need to do. Let me practice my, let me practice my gratitude because it's not that natural thing. Anything else? I uh, I try to get back to how I first found God. Mm -hmm. I think that's different for every person. Um, just getting back to your roots. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Um, getting back to where you first found God. And a lot of times when we do find that disconnect or it's like, God, where are you? Going back to your roots can be really, really helpful. Um, so go back to your roots. When did you first accept Christ as your Savior? When did you first have that experience with God? Or when did you feel um, that loving touch of God? So Mandela, in his um, biography, um, he, he talks a lot about having to hold on to those different moments where God is walking with him and he knows. So those are those different moments that we have to hold on to and go back to that feeling um, of God carrying us. But many dark moments. But we also, y'all have to make a choice. I don't want to be in despair. Some of us have become so comfortable living in a state of despair that we kind of reject the light. We've talked about it becoming comfortable in that state of despair. So we have to make it a point and say, God, I don't want to be in despair. And when we make up our minds that we don't want to be in despair, then we're more likely to do the actions and to do the work to get out of despair. And I know sometimes it is hard and um, to see your way out. It's hard to see your way through and um, it, it's not that easy. And that's when it's like, okay, maybe I'll, I'll reach out and I'll get some help because I don't even have the capacity that I need. So again, when you know you're not the only one, you resist the lies that you're going through alone. So when Mandela was in solitary confinement for years, they were attempting again to break them. And when they do that, um, incarcerating folks is, is strategic. They're doing that to break the spirits of folks. But what it does is actually when you're in that um, spirit of isolation, it, it tends to make you more aggressive. Um, 
studies have shown, shown it makes you more aggressive it makes you unable to relate to different people so you come out having a more difficult time relating and being in relationship with one another in the same way goes when we isolate ourselves spiritually when we isolate ourselves in our mess and in our, our depression and our different states when it's time to come back out and relate with folks it gets a little bit um, more difficult to be able to relate and to just be able to connect so it's important for us to resist the lie that we're the only one ones going through this and we're the only ones suffering because unfortunately suffering is a part um, of living and it's all around the world. Um, Didi said humbleness, humbleness and um, humility. That's a good way. Um, being humble um, is also important. So um, again, what can you do um, from where you are? What do you have from where you are in tapping into those things that I actually have? Maybe you don't feel like going to the gym, but I can stand up. What can you do from the space that you're in, from the mental space, from the physical space, from the spiritual space? What are those things that you actually can do? Can you journal from your bed? You may not be able to get out of the bed, but can you journal from the bed? You may not want to go to church yet, but can you go online and actually watch a sermon? So making sure that you are fighting throughout the struggle and just not giving up hope. He was in jail for nearly 30 years, y'all, but he didn't stop living. He continued to live even while he was there. So he started writing his book and telling the story about his life. So if he had given over to death or, or given over to the fact that he would be in prison the rest of his life, he would not have gotten, we may not have gotten that amazing book that we got. He also encouraged others to get their education and he got his law degree while he was actually in prison. So what can you do in the midst of your storm in order for you to just keep moving? Even if it's just a little thing, how can you just keep moving? So I want us to look at Genesis chapter 39, verses 20 through 23. Um, and we're using some of these scriptures in the different scriptures where folks were in prison, because a lot of times when we are going through, it almost feels like we're bound. Um, we feel bound spiritually. So while we may not be in a physical prison, we almost feel stuck. Have y'all ever felt like it's almost like you're stuck in something? It's like, I can't get out. Um, there's something blocking me. Um, so we want to make sure that we have the tools to get um, out of those. So Genesis chapter 39, verses 20 through 23. And that says, Joseph's master took him, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all of those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So this scripture, again, um, is somebody else who is serving God at this time, who is doing what he was supposed to do. Again, that can be one of the frustrating things, y'all, when we feel like we're doing what we're supposed to do. Um, we're following what God has said, and yet we're being persecuted or we're being imprisoned. So even in our text, we see that even when we're on the path, a lot of times we're still going to face persecution. Um, Mandela was on a path to freedom, and yet he faced um, persecution. And here, it's important as we go through to understand and as we're examining to allow the spirit to let us know what it is that really keeps us bound and what, what's actually hurting us. And he was in prison. Joseph was in prison by the person he actually served. And a lot of times our hurt and what we're dealing with, we may think it's the issue, but it's not even the issue or what somebody did. It's the person who actually did this thing to us. And it's like, God, this could have been any other person. It would not have bothered me, but why this person? So this is Joseph's master who ended up, um, his, the person who he was serving, the person he was in service to, the person he was giving his all to, who ended up putting him in prison. And sometimes we can become stuck when we don't examine the fact that it's the people who have hurt us. And we're not necessarily hurt by the thing, but we're hurt by the people and their actions. So in seeing this, we have to actually pay attention um, to what it is so we can move through the who um, in order to heal. So maybe it's, it's not that, um, that you were attacked, 
but it's that this person who you trusted is the one who attacked you. Um, Nelson Mandela, he was betrayed at different times. Um, we go through different um, levels of betrayal. So betrayal, I'm sorry, betrayal. So sometimes our, our difficulties aren't even on the what has happened and we have to focus on the actual hurt and what we're feeling towards the person. And we have to be willing to release that and to release those feelings in order to move through the storm so that our, our hearts are not the ones that are bitter. So my question, um, Jackie says, sometimes I have to surround myself with positive people. So surrounding ourselves with positive people and acknowledging those folks who have hurt us and created different um, bitterness in our hearts so that we aren't in a, a prison. Um, while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. It's so important, you all, for us to know that whether we're in prison or whether we're going through um, a different storm, God is with us. God does not leave us. So again, that vantage point, Joseph, in this, this matter, he could have been like, God, I don't know where you are. Here I am back again. You know, my brother's done done me wrong. And now I'm finding myself back here. Like, really, God, really? And all I'm trying to do is serve you. But at the same time, the Lord was with him. And our vantage point, when we're just, again, focused on the problems, we miss that big picture that everything is working for our good and that God can use everything again. Um, so Joseph, unsuspecting people, unsuspecting people. When Mandela was in prison, he met some of his lifelong folks. He, he met people who he, would, he had built relationships with, people who still speak to him um, to this day. Um, and when Joseph was in prison, the warden was actually the one who gave Joseph favor and who didn't pay any attention to him uh, because he just allowed him to operate freely because of something that the Lord had placed on his heart. And that's why it's so important for us, even in the midst of our storms, y'all, to treat people kindly and never sleep on the folks that God can use to be a blessing in our storms. And sometimes we expect it to come from our siblings or we expect it to come from our parents or our best friends or our spouses. But a lot of times God is sending somebody else to be a blessing to you. So just make sure that in the midst of of the storm that you are actually open to um, other folks being a blessing to you. Sometimes your help will literally come from the people who you least, you, um, least likely expected. Um, let's look at Acts chapter 16 verses 22 through 26. Acts chapter 16, verses 22 through 26. And this was something that um, Mandela found um, in his life that, that we saw. Um, Acts chapter 16, verses 22 through 26. It says, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Just to stop right there. Um, a lot of times when we are going and we are being attacked, other folks will jump on the bandwagon and begin to attack you as well. And we can't let that be something that takes us further. But we have to, again, keep our eyes open and remember that God's numbers don't add up to man's numbers. So if God before you, God is more than the whole world against you. So a lot of times we can feel the pressure of everybody being against us. Mandela literally went from just having a few enemies to having enemies across the world. Everybody who wanted to keep folks oppressed, everybody who wanted to maintain systems of apartheid. So when you get to that, that place where other folks are against you, it's difficult sometimes. And that's when you have to realize and repeat to yourself, if God before me is more than the whole world against me. And remember that even though it doesn't look fair and it doesn't look like it's an even playing field, we have somebody fighting for us who gives us strength, who gives us a different level of power and who is able to do things like put wardens in place who are going to be there and who's able to do things like what happens in this scripture. So let's continue reading in the Acts chapter 16, 22 through 26. It says, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. So not only were they arrested, then they were beaten. They were stripped and they were beaten. They were flogged. Then they were thrown into prison and told to, to be, they, they had to be watched really carefully. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. 
about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. This is so key, y'all. We cannot lose our praise and our worship in the midst of the storm. So they had been beaten, they had been flogged, and yet they had a song in their heart. And a lot of times you may not have a full song, but can you muster up a hymn? Can you muster up a, um, a humming? Can you muster, muster up a, a moaning? They, they used to say, I don't, um, the old older saints <laughs> used to just moan with it. Um, so what do you have to muster up again so that you don't stay in this place of despair? Because again, we are fighting. So they mustered up a song and they were praying and they were singing hymns to God. And as they were singing hymns to God, other folks were listening to them. So again, they were encouraging themselves and they were encouraging other people around them. We overcome by the blood and the power of our testimonies. So even in the midst of our struggle, in the midst when you can muster up a song in your spirit, it's going to give somebody else hope. And then that person gives you hope. And then you all are able to feed off of the hope of one another. And sometimes you just need that encouraging word so remain in worship and remain around folks who are able to worship even if you can so about midnight it says Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken at once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. So Paul and Silas knew that they still had work to do. So even though they had been beaten, they had been flogged, their vantage point was something different, that they had been called to a different work. And when we have purpose and we know that God has called us to do work, we know that if we are stuck in this place right now, and if we are going through right now, this has to be temporary because there is more for us to do on the other side. We were talking Sunday about being able to cross over into our Jordan. But as we cross over, y'all, there are going to be more Jordans to cross over at every different level that God has for us. There are going to be different wilderness periods and wilderness seasons that we're going to have to go through in order to get to the next level of, uh, of God's advancement. So this thing doesn't just come with, with bells and whistles, but it comes with struggle. And in the midst of that struggle, we have to be willing to stand. We can't give ourselves over to despair. And we have to be willing to continue to walk with the Holy Spirit. So we also have to be mindful of the distortions that come in our minds when we're going through and bring every captive um, every thought captive back to God. And this next scripture is actually when Paul is defending his ministry. And when we go through, sometimes we can doubt our callings. We can doubt where whether we're in the place that God has called us to be. We start to doubt ourselves. But like Paul, we have to resist that notion that we're out of God's will just because we're going through something. And we fight with our spiritual weapons, which means we fight with worship. We fight with prayer. We fight with all of those things. So let's look at 2 Corinthians um, chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. Jackie said, this is just why I have to check out from Facebook sometimes. I check out and have to turn to God even stronger. I need to be fortified by my praying and talking with him during those times. Again, shutting down when we're going through to reconnect, going back to our roots, doing what you have to do in order so that you are strengthened and that you are able to stand. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 5, it says, The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. When we're going through, the enemy will put all types of things in our minds. We will stay in our head so much. We will think this. We will create stories. And we have to take every thought captive. And this may actually be a scripture that we need to say to ourselves. I make every thought. I take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. And the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of this world. Remembering again, you are our power and tapping in to that divinity that we have when we don't have our own strength. And when we do feel like we're in bondage and we do feel like we're imprisoned, um, it's really, really important. So just, just that scripture. And this is something that um, Mandela had to do when you have a, a whole world that is against you um, or a whole system that is against what you're doing or even the, the folks that are against what you're doing. 
eventually it's, it's human nature to begin to doubt yourself when things aren't working out it's human nature to begin to to doubt the path that you're on but that's when we're like god no i know what you told me i know what you said i know that this too shall pass and that's when we have to to keep moving forward so being conscious of the thoughts that we allow, even the negative people, you all, who we allow. We know there's some people who we will call and they will take us deeper and they will go right there with us and make us have an even bigger pity party and, and cause us to think that the world is against us. Those aren't the people we necessarily need to talk to um, at, at different points that when we're going through and we're trying to ensure that we can come out. So another thing that you have to do is remember those who've suffered and done it before you. Mandela also talks about, I'm looking to those who had done the work. We, we talk about Mandela being a, a change agent, and he was absolutely a change agent. Um, he did remarkable things, but he had examples of people who had suffered before him. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. Again, y'all, being reminded of those who have gone before us in the cloud of witnesses and the folks who live for God and how they were able to get through this. And even looking at some of the stories, whether you go back and read the story of Joseph or read the story of Peter and read the story of Jesus and how they had to go through different periods of bondage. And yet, y'all, they got through. So understanding that people have done it before you and you are going to be able to do it too. I also believe it's important for us to suspend our pride sometimes and connect to other people who have been through or who are going through what we are going through so that they can walk us through it. But in order for us to do that, we have to actually open up our mouths and share um, what we're actually going through. And so that we can be the next size, the next cloud of witnesses that will help the next generation or those, our peers who are walking beside us or coming alongside us, be able to get through the same things. But if we're not honest about what we're going through and how we got through and how we got over, those folks who are right next to us and need that word or that wisdom that we have, they miss it. Mandela, when he was in prison, he was working with all of the prisoners who wanted to be worked with. He helped everybody who wanted to be helped. And so many of his, his quotes talk about the humanity. And when we recognize that our purpose is greater than ourselves, you all, we have no choice but to get it together. We have to get it together because it is um, so much bigger than us. And we see that we're not in this, in this battle on our own. Um, we're not struggling on our own. Um, it's another quote from Mandela. It says, our human compassion binds us to one another, not in pity or patronizingly, but as human beings who have learned how to come and how to turn our common suffering into hope for the future. So again, we are suffering together as a people. We all have different periods of suffering, but we have to learn how to transform that suffering into the hope for the future. God, I see where I am now, but I have hope. And even thinking about the notion of faith, you can have faith all day, but if you're not hoping in anything, then you have nothing that's going to activate your faith. So you have nothing to actually practice your faith. So we can't, again, be a people without hope. What are you hoping for? What are you dreaming for? And you have to begin, write those things down, put those things on paper. Mandela had a hope for um, an equal nation, a world that was free. So he had a hope. So even though he was in prison, he used his faith to get him through so he could make it to that point where he could see what he actually hoped for. So some of us have to to even in the midst of our um, our struggles and feeling down and, and our storms, we have to find that thing that we are hoping for. So I encourage us to actually write down what is it that you are hoping for? What do you hope for for yourself? What do you hope for for the greater humanity? And when we know and recognize that this thing is so much bigger than us, y'all, it gives us a different level of fight. It gives us a different level of fight. And Mandela's... Um, 
um, love for other people. He was the epitome of the Matthew 5, 43, 48 scripture of loving your neighbors and blessing those who um, curse you and praying for those who misuse you. These people did him wrong. Mandela was um, able to forgive these people and come out of prison and work hand in hand with the people. Can y'all imagine how many people he had to forgive? This was 30 years of this man's life. 30 years of this man's life. Um, that he were, was taken um, from him. And he said, one of the things he said is, I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom. I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. As I walked out the gate, that would lead to my freedom. I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. Some of us are in prison and our storms are so magnified because we are bitter. We are bitter and we are carrying on hate, um, carrying hate for others in our hearts and we haven't forgiven and let go. So we have these chains and we have this bondage and we have life that comes through. And every time life comes through, it feels so much worse because we have this bitterness and we have this um, bondage and this anger and this hatred that we haven't actually released from our hearts. And it's consuming and it will keep us stuck in our storms way longer than what we're supposed to. So in order to really move forward and to move to get free, y'all, we have to be forgiving and we have to let the bitterness go. And as we do that, our vantage point will shift. We'll be able to see the different things that God is showing us. We'll be able to see the light. We'll be able to see um, what's distorted facts. We'll be able to see the attacks of the enemy, but yet we'll be able to see where God's hands are all over us too. So again, we have to make sure that we are looking um, looking at the vantage point and lifting up our heel, lifting up our eyes to the hills from which cometh our help. Another quote, and I want to just leave us with a few more quotes before we pray out. And if there are any um, prayer requests, um, please feel free um, to leave your prayer, prayer requests. Some of these quotes, oh my gosh, they're just amazing. The greatest glory in living is not in failing and not in falling, but in rising every time we fall. Knowing, y'all, that we're going to fall in life, it's okay to fall, being okay with the fall. I learned that the courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Again, the vantage point in telling ourselves, God did not give me the spirit of fear, but of a sound mind and of love and the power of a sound mind. So recognizing we have these fears, begin again, then again, taking our vantage point and saying, I know this fear doesn't come from God. I know this fear doesn't come from God. So I'm going to be able to walk through this. I'm going to stand and I'm going to go through this. There is no passion to be found playing small and settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living. Stop taking the easy way out, y'all. Just because we have to struggle doesn't mean that we're supposed to be taking the easy way out. Continue to press through. Continue to press through and understand that playing small doesn't mean that you, you, you won't have to struggle. It just means you'll be in bondage because you're not going to be free in doing those different things that God has called you to do. So understand that you can't play small. And I love this one. For to be free is to not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. So in our bondage, we have to make sure that as we're getting free, we're not causing other people to be bound because in that 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 way, we're just picking up more, more levels of oppression, causing more oppression. But we want to be free, but we want to cause and help other folks be free too. And the last quote I leave you with, is I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And I say us with the Holy Spirit, remembering that we decide our destinies and that God wants the best for us. God has plans for us. And we have to y'all look up. Our vantage points are everything. So as we go through the storms, look at the different folks who've done it before us. Make sure you're lifting up your, your heads, looking up. Make sure you're actually dealing with the true issues that you're going through. Um, The who that actual hurt and just keep standing. So 
Let us pray. God, we give you honor, glory, and praise. God, I thank you for the life of Nelson Mandela. God, I thank you for the fight and um, that he had. Thank you for the work that he put forth. God, thank you for the freedom, oh God, that he worked for and that he um, worked to allow the people in South Africa to see God. God, I pray that you would just speak to all of us, oh God, that in any place of bondage, in any place of despair, oh God, that you would just begin to lift us out, oh God, to bring us out of those places, oh God that we come back to the places of hope, oh God, where we hope in you, where we hope and we dream, oh God, in the purpose and the plans that you have for our lives, oh God. So right now, God, we just decree and declare, oh God, that we stand, God, that we stand strong, that we stand firm in your word, oh God, that we stand firm in your promises, oh God, and that when we go through, God, we trust that you are going through with us, oh God. Teach us, oh God, like Mandela, how to keep hope, oh God. Teach us like Mandela how to continue working, oh God, even through the struggle. Teach us, oh God, how to continue loving, oh God. Teach us, oh God, how to release the bitterness, how to release the hatred, oh God, so that we can move forward, oh God, in wholeness, oh God, in peace, oh God, and to do your work, oh God. So just show us, continue to guide us, God, as we strive to live by your spirit. Touch and bless every person who watches this and is under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining us. God bless you all and have a great night.